Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people here this evening. It's it's really fantastic to see such a, an interest um, in this topic. I want to start by thanking uh, Breed Leahy and Simon Mead from Dauphin's Barn and Inchicore Libraries for hosting this event. It's great that they're involved in this. And uh, I also just wanted to say uh, a few words of introduction about what inspired me to actually approach Kathy to give this talk. Um, as some of you may know, Rialto Court is currently, or, or buildings as it was known, is currently under threat from uh, the fire officer uh, and the building is in risk of being condemned as a fire hazard. Um, but this fully occupied building is in need of major investment uh, to bring an 18th century model development up to 21st century standards. Now to achieve this will require a concerted effort by all the current owners, but we can't do this alone. We'll need support of many who are concerned with protecting and cherishing this iconic piece of Dublin heritage. Um, I hope Kathy's talk will raise awareness about this and why this building is worthy of all our care and attention. But it's not only to raise awareness about the, build, the plight of the buildings that I approached Kathy. As many of you know, the whole of Dublin 8 is currently a target for developers who seek to make profit from building hotels and co-living accommodation without regard to the wishes of the residents, their health and their well-being. I only need to mention the proposed developments in Player Wills, Bailey Gibson, Rialto Cinema sites, and uh, most recently we've also learned that the much cherished quiet space for meditation, the, the Grotto on Mead Street, is also uh, under threat. Residents are very staunchly fighting each development case by case, but we also have to get together to convey the bigger picture about what is happening in Dublin 8. Um, the 18th and 19th century developers who built the buildings of Rialto, Cant Fort, Spitalfields and the Tanters had a big vision, not only to create housing, but also to create homes that where people could thrive and communities could thrive. And I hope that their example can be followed by 21st century developers, planners, and policy makers. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll, you'll all be inspired to join in this um, campaign. I'm very grateful to Kathy for agreeing to, take, to do this talk. Uh, she has thrown her, uh, her heart and soul into it. And uh, I'm so grateful to her for, for agreeing to come on with it and talk to us tonight. So without further ado, uh, thank you again, everyone. And um, I'll hand over to Kathy now to give you, tell you about the history of Rialto buildings. Lovely, thank you very much, Maria. And thank you all again for joining us tonight. Just a little reminder uh, about using the chat function if you want to ask a question at the uh, Jordan, the talk, or something comes to your mind, pop a question there into chat and either Simon or Breed will moderate them at the end. And also just to make sure everybody is on mute because uh, no more than I want you hearing the household sounds from here. <laughs> I don't want to hear yours either. So uh, we move on and I just go to screen share now and just bear with me for one moment while we get the presentation up and running. Thank you. Now, can everybody see? Mario, you give me a thumbs up if everyone can, if you can see that. Is that all right? Yeah. Great, lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's an absolute honour to be here tonight uh, for a number of different reasons. And the main one, the main one is, of course, it's about Rialto. And Rialto is my home turf. Uh, it made me. 
I am a product of Rialto. Um, I grew up there. I love the place to bits and I love sharing the story of Dublin. Um, the historian in residence, which is a position I hold with Dublin City Council at the moment for both the South Central and South East areas, uh, is an initiative that grew out of the 1916 commemorations. And it has been an absolute pleasure to work with all the various communities in those two parts of Dublin. So I hope you can see the screen clearly, and it shows you the buildings at Rialto, which uh, gave the title to the talk tonight. Uh, today that's known, that, that block is known as Rialto Court, but for the function of this particular talk, I would be referring, it, referring to it as the buildings, and I'll give a little bit of an explanation of that in a while as well. I put something else up on the screen there, on the opening screen. How many of you have seen that before, the, the pillar? Have you passed it? Mm -hmm. You've probably all passed it. Anybody in Rialto probably would have seen this at some stage or other and wouldn't have given it a second thought. So hold that thought in your mind because, well, we might be hearing a little bit about that in a little while. So just a reminder to everybody, once again, make sure you're on mute. Um, uh, as we go through the talk tonight so that I can get a clear run at it. So, buildings in Rialto. Let's hear it for Rialto. This appeared uh, quite recently on a Twitter feed and it just shows you the vibrant village, inner city village really, it's an inner city suburb village if you like. Uh, Rialto thrives, it has its shops, um, people come and go in every day, people who work in the area, people who live in the area, and quite a lot of people who live in Rialto work locally as well. The other thing about Rialto is those links. You find people with long-standing connections with the area. How many conversations I've struck up with people uh, going through when I'd be around Rialto, and they are telling me, that their grandparents had connections here, or they have an uncle who lives around the corner, or there's cousins that are up the road, and I tick a lot of those boxes as well. So it's one of those places that when people came to live here, they stayed, and their families are there since. So just as I say, let's hear it for Rialto, and as they put it up on Twitter, Rialto's rapid. So uh, it's, it's Dublin, but it's got a, a character all of its own. It's one of the five O's of Dublin. The children love this particular one. Um, and it, it's uh, when we say the five O's, it's the O, the O at the end. So Rialto is one. Uh, of course, the other ones are Pimlico, not that far away. Uh, we have to move a little bit further down our canal to get Portobello. And then we go north side for the other two, Marino and uh, Phibsborough, which is a bit of a cheat, but it's one of the O's. Uh, locals will tell you there's a sixth, and the locals in question are the of James's Street School, because every time I talk to them about their area, they say to me, Kathy, there's a sixth O, and it's Jambo, so we have to include Jambo, we're talking about Rialto, so there really are six O's in, in Dublin. But the Rialto bit is a wonderful, wonderful story all of its own. When you look at Rialto, you can actually see evidence of former, of the former world. The field patterns are evident in the way the developments happened. As each field was sold, an estate was built, and we can still see those field patterns We can still see those field patterns in the estates that are, are built up around the Rialto area. Uh, it's linked to the Grand Canal. You cannot tell the story of Rialto without mentioning the Grand Canal. And of course, key to it is the bridge. And then later on, we had Harcourt Lock, which actually is the real name of the bridge. It should be Harcourt Bridge called after the Earl of Harcourt, the chairman of the Grand Canal Company. Harcourt Lock then is further up near Shore Road. Talking about the estate of Rialto buildings, Rialto Street and Rialto Cottages, or as I said, the buildings you could use Rialto Court to call them that, is an evidence of philanthropy, of how giving back 
is evident in the buildings that are there. Very, very closely linked to the big, big industries of Victorian Dublin that were brewing and distilling. Get mixed housing, you get a diverse community. So when you mix your housing stock between cottage or between a house, between apartment, between flat and different styles of housing, you will get different people coming to live there. And that's what makes Rialto thrive. It has such a range of mixed housing in the area. We get a diverse community and we always had a diverse community. The area of Rialto and the house around it has been home to generations of Dublin people, Irish people, and people who came to live in our city. If we took the buildings as a witness and maybe a participant, we can certainly say it was part of international and national history, as well as local history, as well as forming Dublin. And it also witnessed our revolution. And like any estate in any part of Dublin, it has its famous residents, people who have been there in the past and who are really well known. So we're going to work our way through the talk and touch on some of these things. So as I say, the first thing, you can't talk about Rialto without talking about the bridge. And this is the original plans for the Rialto Bridge. You can see that it was built, uh, not so much the bridge being the important part, it was the roads leading up to it that were really, really important because they needed to create a rise in the roadway to get it over the newly dug canal. So anybody who knows the chemist near Rialto Bridge would suddenly realise why it seems set into the wall as you go up towards the bridge and how you have that distinct hump as you go over the top of the bridge. So it was more than building a bridge. They had to build this elaborate road system to build up to the bridge and to sweep down from it. What's really interesting about this original plan is that the bridge is actually called Rialto Bridge in the plan, not Harcourt Bridge. The real name of the bridge is Harcourt Bridge, but the name Rialto seems to have been there from the very beginning. And it actually appears on the plan itself. You might just about make it out on screen. So Rialto as a place name has been there from 1766. We find it again in 1830. We find it again all through the 1800s. And um, evidence of it, such as Rialto Lodge, which was located up near Griffith Bridge, so a little bit further up, uh, would be beyond the Little Sisters in Kamenum, in that direction. Um, we also had a Rialto house in the area at one time. We have a Rialto terrace. And later we had the Rialto buildings, Rialto Costas, Rialto Street. So the name Rialto eventually became the name of the area. And this is an old uh, stylized drawing of the canal at the Rialto Bridge. And it was an extremely fashionable place to go and take the air. And this is another image of it. And what you really notice about this image are those upright trees. Because when the canal was being constructed originally, and it was the mainline canal that we're talking about initially in this talk, that's the piece that went from the Guinness Brewery west. When you look at it, it was for a number of reasons the canal was built, obviously for transport. So it's, it's the equivalent of a monorail being constructed in the city. But the second thing, was the water. It was a water supply system as well. And the, that is why the Corporation of Dublin rode in behind the canal building project in order to achieve a new water supply into the city. Look at those beautiful trees along the banks. They're part of the whole story as well. They're elm trees uh, grown on the banks for two reasons. One, the root system held the clay in, so protected the bank. But secondly, an elm tree grows straight, it grows upright. That wood could be used for the piping system for the water. So the elm tree 
was as important to the whole idea of the canal system as anything else was. Hold the image of the trees there in your head for a minute, because when we look at the map, you can actually see at the very top of the map of 1839, each individual tree drawn in on the map along the canal bank up in the top left hand corner of the map. The other things you can see on this map are the aforementioned Rialto Lodge. So you can see it there where the other line of the canal met. The circular line, the one that went from what we know as Shore Bridge today, it actually went from Griffith Bridge all the way to Ring's End, and that became the passenger line, leaving the original main line, the piece that went to Guinnesses, as the industrial line of the canal as such. So you can see Rialto is very rural at this time. One place you can see there, just in the middle of the screen, is Bagot Place. Um, and in the image, as you follow the blue line in the centre of the screen, uh, the blue line that's running up through the centre, that is actually the South Circular Road. And if you follow that up, you can see the bridge is marked as Harcourt Bridge on this particular map. And there is a building just beside the bridge. We'd know that as uh, Portman House today. Uh, so little things that are in the maps are beginning to appear that we're kind of familiar with. So Bagot Place, we will be talking about that in a few minutes. Just before I leave the bridge, did you know that it once had its own little built-in devil? There was a little head set in to the centre of the bridge underneath. And that is an image of the Rialto devil. Now, when I was a child, I was often shown under the existing bridge, the disturbed bricks that are there under the bridge. You won't see them now with the Lewis, but um, you can see the disturbed bricks when I was young. And that was where the devil, I was told, used to live. Later on, I discovered it was an actual figurine that was originally in the bridge, had been moved for safekeeping to the Grand Canal headquarters up near Guinness. And the idea of the little head being in the bridge, as the bargemen went under the first bridge on the system, which was Rialto Bridge, they would tip the head of the devil for luck, hoping they'd make it to Shannon. So tipping the head of the Rialto devil was the beginning of your journey west. The head, I understand, is in safekeeping, at least I sincerely hope it is as the new development is taking place down there at Eckland Street at the moment. And this is the part of the canal. When I say it was industrial, you can see from this image that it is industrial. And um, this is up near what was formerly the Marble Lane Distillery. Most of us might know it as the air um, exchange today. At that turn beyond where the Lewis ends, and um, that's the way the canal turned in preparation for going into the main harbour. And this was the main harbour. This image is taken from the Guinness storehouse, looking down over the main harbour. And this was the harbour. So the curved building you can see on the right hand side there is the building at the top of Eklund Street. And you can see the way the barges are lined up, similar to the way you would see articulated trucks lined up in an industrial estate today. So imagine the canal being the equivalent of the M50, only it was barges and water. Today we'd have articulated trucks on roads. It was hugely important. It was a hugely important part of Dublin and the Rialto Bridge was the first bridge out of the system as you left the harbour at Guinness. I mentioned that we can see the field patterns and I touched on a couple of the houses that were around our Rialto Street. So one of them, the, probably one of the better known one, is Glemalura House. Now, the locals might know that as um, uh, Macaulay's, uh, later on became Macaulay's pub. Um, and uh, it, it, it was once the home, uh, for a very, very long time, the home of Charlie Byrne and later on Lawrence Byrne, Larry Byrne. Um, the Glemalura is interesting. They had connections to Wicklow. And again, that's something that we might just refer to later on. But they named their home after their home place in Glemalure near Rathdrum in County Wicklow. 
Um, in fact, it was said of Lawrence Byrne that when he paid for the bell in Dolphins Barn Church, uh, the ringing of the bell would be heard loud and clear in Glenlure in his home place. It was supposed to be an extremely loud bell for a small local church. The other one is the house that I mentioned earlier, located at the bridge. Uh, you, this is a view of it actually taken from the Lewis, and this is the view you get today of Port Mahon House from which we get the various Port Mahon Drive. And um, most people would know Port Mahon House as a landmark in the area. At the time we're talking about, the middle of the 1800s, Port Mahon House was located in extensive farmland that stretched all the way from Rialto to Griffith Bridge all along the Grand Canal. In fact, there's evidence in the house to suggest that it had been, the orientation of the house had been twisted at some stage and the actual main door into the house would have been the one we're looking at there from the back. And the orientation of the house was turned at a later date, probably after the canal itself was built. That was the home of the famous Alderman Michael Flanagan, a very, very well-known local politician. The other house that we saw on the map earlier is Baggett House, and there were cottages associated with it, located right on the South Circular Road. And um, in my research, I have discovered it was the home of Tasker Keys, and Tasker Keys was a dairyman. And when I kept going, this is what I found in November 1911. How about this for an ad for a part of Rialto. Public auction and important sale of dairy cattle, including 30 milch cows, four horses, a farm carts, field grain, timber, general dairy effects, a milk float and a pony trap, all for auction at Baggett House, Rialto Dolphins Barn, Dublin. Tasker Keyes had passed away at this stage and the Keyes family were moving out of Baggett House and in the 1911 census I discovered them living up at Rehoboth Place in Dolphins Barn. When I said that people were inclined to stay in the area, that's not unusual. That's always been a pattern and they're a good example of family who are selling up the dairy business but staying in the general area and we find that quite a lot even with current residents. They don't like moving too far. Why would we look at housing? This is an image that I found in the City Archive, and it dates from 1913. What you're looking at there are two water closets. You know what I mean when I say that. And you can see a standpipe with no tap, a continuous flow of water into a bucket. They are the sanitary arrangements for 70 people living in the liberties of Dublin in 1913. That's not unusual. They were the conditions in the Liberties and throughout Dublin all through the 1800s and into the 1900s, quite sadly. So these are the unsanitary, poor, disease promoting conditions that people were living in in Dublin after the famine many people who have moved up, these were the conditions that they were left with. I'm sure you'll agree with me that two loos and a flowing water pipe are no facilities for 70 people. There are hardly facilities for anybody, but this is what we had. This is what promotes the Dublin Artisan Dwelling Company to be eventually founded. Um, 1876, so we're back a number of years before that image so imagine the improvements that these beautiful housing uh, brought. It's a semi-philanthropic private enterprise, but the influential people of Dublin are involved in it. Their goal, we're going to provide quality housing for Dublin's working classes. And overall, we're just going to improve those awful housing conditions that I showed you in the image just before this one. They plan to make a profit. But here's the key, that profit is going to be reinvested 
in the company from rents collected and from the donations and the loans that they're going to uh, acquire. They're going to be reinvested to provide more housing, more quality housing with good conditions for Dublin's working classes. So it's a continuous circle of providing housing. The main focus here is the house and the person, not the profit. They raise money in various ways. They have share issues, for example. They get some government loans. And if they get the government loans, this is when they get inventive with the house they're going to do. The term buildings is generally applied to all of their states. So for a very good example, not too far away from Rialto, are the cottages we have around Maxwell Street and Eugene Street. Um, they were called Cork Street buildings, although they were a mix of cottages and houses. So you get that term buildings applied to general housing. Another case in, in, in question would be Black Pitts buildings. They were, it was a term used, a popular term. You find it in some northern counties as well, uh, new buildings is, is often a little suburb in some of our northern uh, towns. And you find it extensively in the United Kingdom in general, in Great Britain, that term buildings is often applied, although they wouldn't necessarily be anything different to cottages, houses and apartments. So, so the address becomes buildings. And when they got government money, Instead of just building houses and lines of them, they got inventive. And the best example locally that I can find to illustrate this is what they did around the Coombe near the Liberties, around Great Street, around Reginald Street, where they created all those little squares of cottages off the main street, designed as squares or cul-de-sacs, so the children could play safely and be watched and cared for by neighbours and neighbouring houses. So no child would be left, say, locked out. They would be watched. It takes a village to raise a child. This was creating villages to raise families and creating communities in the process. So you can see the lovely pattern in the circle that I have on the map there of those little squares that we have off Grey Street in the Liberties of Dublin. Brilliant example of thought out housing and achieved by using government loans to support the efforts of the, the company itself. Rialto Buildings itself. Now, for the moment, we refer to the apartment block as the buildings. When I said influential people were involved in the Artisan Dwelling Company, the biggest invest, investor and sponsor of that company was by, by a long shot, Guinness. They invest heavily in trying to improve the housing stock in Dublin by doing it through the Dublin Artisan Dwelling Company. In 1883, Edward Cecil Guinness himself approaches the Dublin Artisan Dwelling Company and requests that they build a three-storey barracks flats in Rialto for his brewery workers. They're still there today. Six years later, Guinnesses sell back the Rialto buildings to the Dublin Artisan Dwelling Company. So the relationship isn't very long. But what's really attractive to the Dublin Artisan Dwelling Company is the lands and the open fields that were be around these uh, apartments. The reason for selling them back is Guinness are now setting up their own trust, later to be called the Ivy Trust, and that was being established in 1890. And they have plans of their own to build houses for their workers. By 1890, the same year, Dublin Artists and Dwelling Company then continued the expansion on the site beside this apartment block. Um, and, and proceeded to go ahead with the way they wanted to build, which was this mixed estate of terrace two-storey houses and single-storey cottage dwellings, some with a single bay window and others with a double bay window. So you've got some that were 
small but one window and then you got others with two windows which were slightly bigger cottages depending on family size this is how you mix the community this is how you provide it for housing for a variety of different family sizes different groups single people retired people you got it all mixed in together and this it has to be the find of the night this is actually an album photograph from the Guinness Archive. It's the earliest picture that I could find of Rialto buildings before the cottages and Rialto Street were built. So this is when it's in the care of, of Dublin artists, the dwelling for Guinnesses alone. But look at the picture in more detail. It really shows them as brand new apartments. These were cutting edge. Remember, this is the latter part of the 1800s. These had in-house sanitation. Compare that with what was still existing in the Liberties by 1913, when I showed you that image of the two closets and the, the, the continuous water supply. But what's really precious about this is it shows us the feels around Rialto buildings. What a healthy place to go and live. You are living in the countryside, but you are striking distance for work. And how we know it's the countryside, the horse in the image is pulling a plough. It's ploughing the fields around the buildings. And the man in the white outfit in, to the left of the picture is sowing seeds in the ploughed field. So the people living in the buildings, and particularly those that had the open balcony, were looking out over fields, ploughed fields, crops growing, a total countryside, and yet they're living in an urban environment and they're living very, very close to work. And this is an image that's held by the Guinness Archive. Not only that, but you got your early morning call to go to work. And this is an image, and I'm really grateful to Helen for, for sourcing this for me, of the Guinness Bell that was located at Rialto buildings. It's inscribed with a shamrock, you can see it there. So when the bell turned over on, on, on its uh, chime, the shamrock would go up and down and rung every morning to call the brewery workers to their workplace. And again, not only is the photograph the original photograph of Rialto buildings in safe hands in the Guinness archive. So too is the bell. And you can see it there in the archive, all the files tucked in under the various racks and the bell in the middle of it all. Imagine that bell ringing every morning to call the brewery workers to get ready to go to work. Uh, way ahead of its time too, no one would have an excuse for being late. You were called in the morning, then the bell rang, time to go to work. To show you how Guinness was considered within society, this is just an extract uh, that I have from the Freeman's Journal of April 1917. And it's actually a city hall inquiry into the Spitalfields housing development, which took place around Francis Street. It's just the quote from the inspector that I thought was very telling. He said that the remarkable thing was that so few Dublin employers have built houses for their workers. And the only exception he could think of was Guinness. And when you think of that being said at a housing inquiry in City Hall, it shows the esteem that the Guinness family, the company, and everything that went with it, uh, the esteem it was held with within the city. And what a mark it has left in various locations. The image we have there is of what would have been relatively new flats in 1901 of the Ivy Trust in Patrick Street. And the hoarding that you can see there, well, behind that is Patrick's Park being created. All part of having an open space with their housing beside it. And not only was it housing, it had a wash house, it had a night hostel. It had the bats. We all remember the ivy bats. So all of these things were built as part of the complex 
all part of creating a community, a healthy community for their workers to live in. And again, the trust system, the idea was the rent went into the trust, went into the pension scheme, went into providing other services. So again, it's the whole idea of charity, generosity, philanthropy, building with people at the centre of the, the consideration, not profit, putting people first, giving them homes to live in and suitable homes to live in. Here's our map of 1913 and you can see at that stage how the whole estate has been formed. Now there's a few nice interesting bits and pieces on this. You can see quite clearly the houses that I mentioned earlier. So we have Port Mahan House over near the bridge. We have Glen Malure House and the entrance down on the South Circular Road. There's our Rialto Bridge. And here is the whole estate and we call the whole thing Rialto buildings, if you like, including cottages and street at this stage. And there are the original apartments and they are the ones that have the balcony that would have looked over the ploughed fields, the open ploughed fields that were around them in our earlier image. What's particularly interesting is the shape. It fits perfectly into the original field pattern. Every one of the streets has a name. So First Avenue is the one along the canal. There's Second Avenue, Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, Fifth Avenue, stretching on either side of the larger um, flats. Sixth Avenue, Seventh Avenue, and on the South Circular Road itself, we've South View Terrace. They truncate it within their boundary. So Glenmalure House, the lands of it, were the border on the uh, Rialto side, the Rialto Bridge side. And then these other estates, particularly of Bagot House, uh, was the boundary on the other. So it just sits within its field pattern. So we still can recognise the field pattern that was there originally. And you remember I showed you the pillar at the beginning. These were actually the boundary markers that were all around the site and they're still there today. The one on the left hand side is right beside what was Macaulay's pub. It's right there in the middle of Rialto. Most of our Rialtonians will pass that every day and probably never gave it a second thought. And you can see going out behind it, the wall, that's part of the boundary of the Rialto Buildings Estate. This centre one is up on the old canal um, facing into the grounds of the hospital. And the one on the uh, far right of the screen is the one right beside Rialto Church. And if you can see the way they form the boundary of the entire estate, it was probably one of the first gated communities that we had in the area, long losing its gates and integrating fully with the other a community around it. And then a quote from 1890 in the Irish Times, no less, and they just tell us that the works at Rialto South Circle Road are proceeding satisfactorily. Of the 86 cottages being erected, over 60 are roofed and slated, and the majority of these are so advanced, they will very shortly be ready for occupation. So it's all very positive, all very upbeat, they were only begun in 1890, they're nearly ready for occupation in 1890. Not bad for the times at all. This, the timber framed mock Tudor houses that are South View Terrace on the South Circle Road itself, they were built later in 1901 and they bookended the, uh, the estate behind it. There were plans to extend the tram from Dolphin's Barn to Rialto in response for the new community that was moving in. Uh, you know, the population was exploding in the Rialto area. This whole estate was opening up with its apartments, with its houses, with its cottages. So we need transport. So they planned to put the tram in from 1895 
it arrived in 1905. So I hope people weren't waiting too long. But it gave us that really unusual uh, entry on the timetable for the tram company. Um, you got the Rialto and Glass Nevin tram, recognised by a lozenge, a, 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 a brown lozenge shape, a diamond shape. But it had to include Via Dolphins Barn because it had been originally the Dolphins Barn Glass Nevin tram. So even on the tram timetable, Rialto got itself in there from 1905 onwards. Again, I always tell people, you know, when you're looking at local history, please look up, look around you and keep asking why. I hope you never unsee Southview Terrace at the very end of the houses, just before the public house. The sign is there to be seen. I'm highlighting it on the screen for you. Um, I'm sure many of you have passed it on many of an occasion and never saw it before, but it dates from 1901, 120 years ago. This is where the COVID-19 pandemic got me because I really, really wanted to get into the Irish Architectural Archive to look at these in more detail. These are the plans that they hold for what they call the Rialto Extension Scheme. That's the cottage scheme. These are the actual plans. Unfortunately, all I have are these photocopies. Um, I haven't been able to get in to see the real thing. And that is one of my big trips as soon as we're all allowed out once again and allowed into the archives. But the plans are there. And many of the plans of the Artisan Dwelling Company were actually handed over by the Bureau of Military History to the Architectural Archives. So delighted to report they are in safekeeping. I'd love to get into these in more detail and see what the original houses were like. So we have to leave that one there. But just assured that they are available and we will be able to get in and see them someday. And as I say, this is probably a project for somebody to take a step further at a later date. They also include the ones that were um, put in for houses that were built finally in Rialto. And I think these are the ones that we have up around Rialto Park. Um, so they, they continuously, they kept building right up to the 1930s. Uh, this is certainly another part of the Rialto scheme. But again, documents I'd love to go in examine in much, much more detail and um, really have a, a good look at them uh, and get a good informed sense of the, the houses themselves. But suffice for now, we have them and we know where they are. Not only did they build houses, not only did they build apartments, but they put the finishing touches. It wasn't a case of build a block, put people in and hope for the best. They made them look nice. There was little architectural details included, such as various door cases and window sills. In a lot of cases, granite introduced with good reason to keep the stonemasons in business up in the mountains. But you also, if we look at the Rialto buildings, the apartments for a moment, over each doorway was a light holder. So you weren't going home in the dark. It would, you weren't going home in through a dark field. Remember, it was a field before the cottages and houses were there. There was a light to guide you. So the lights originally probably were oil lights, later gas lights. The stands for holding them are there. In one or two cases, people have put a, a hanging basket out of them in more recently. But they're there. They're part of the original features of the Rialto buildings. So most of the houses have the foot scraper. So it's the era of the horse. It's the era of the horse drawn. It's the era of a muddy pathway. And before you went into the house, which was a very precious thing, you scraped your foot on the foot scraper at the doorway before you went into the home. So that's an example of two foot scrapers at the top of Rialto Street. Even the corner details of the houses are extra special. Look at that for a gable detail. There was no need to put a carved piece of red brick in, but they did. 
And this is on the edges of the cottages in, you find them in a number of locations. They made them look nice. There was a sense of these were more than homes. These were community a sense that they were a little bit different. And they were introducing things like the red brick and mixing it with yellow brick. Some of the yellow brick possibly are locally sourced. They're certainly County Dublin brick. Some of them may very well be Dolphins Barn brick. So you were trying to keep business local and you were adding to the features of the actual area as well. So worth having a closer look at the houses and finding those little treats that are there to be found. And what a mixture. Uh, some of them, although we now have tar macadamed roads and all the rest of it, you would be lucky enough to find in the channel the original cobblestones hiding there, actually doing the purpose were put there for originally, which was to help drain the water away so that the roads weren't too muddy. So originally there would have been cobble streets around Rialto, Rialto cottages. The cottages um, lend themselves to that cottage feel. You almost feel like you're in the country when you look at the, the cottages themselves all faced off by the larger red brick houses of Rialto Street themselves and the detail above the windows, the fan above the windows of different brick uh, and the use of granite in windowsills and in doorsteps. And of course, the foot scraper, foot scrapers everywhere because of the times they were built in. And of course, then beautiful ones on the Sarsetta Road themselves. And the hierarchy of housing. These are quite English in their look, the Tudor look. These are the group that are located between the corner shop, which was also part of the whole development, and what we later have, the church. And um, again, mixed details, canopies over the doorways, and these ones picking up on the idea of the front garden, the front garden actually giving you that sense of a journey before you got to the hall door. Looking at these, you can get evidence even by walking around Rialto cottages of what it was like to live in the past. I particularly love the homemade football uh, on the uh, goalpost on the gable of one of the terraces. There it is painted. Nowadays, we're more inclined to put flower pots and various bits and pieces out. But look at how the sun hits the red brick and the warmth, the sense of fitting into its community. You can see it beautifully there in the one part of the buildings that actually had the balcony to the front. Ironically, that is a housing style that we're bringing back into the area. The most recently built apartments over in Dolphin Park almost mirror those of Rialto Court with their balconies to the front. Very, very similar balconies, modern apartments. So in many ways, they were cutting edge way ahead of their time and a style we're still using today. I only wish we went for the warm red brick because it fits so well into our community. In Rialto Street itself, you get a mix of houses. You get these two beautiful ones right at the top of the street, uh, very near where the former canal would have been. They're quite different to the rest of Rialto Street itself. It's said that the cottages were for the labourers and that the, the houses on the street were for the um, supervisors or the timekeeper and that the apartments were for retired and everybody else. So you got this mixed community, one working with the other. I did a little check. I only did the 1901 census. Who were the people who lived here and where were they from? And the best way of breaking it down was to look at birthplace initially. So in Rialto buildings, returning that particular address, now that could, it primarily is the apartments, um, what we would call the court today, Rialto court. Some of them may be Rialto Street or the cottages, but I got 501 census records 
and had a look at them. And from them, I discovered about half were people who were born in Dublin, either the city or the county. But look at what came running up behind us. The 52 that have Wicklow connections. Like Lawrence Byrne and Glemelor House next door, and like the thesis that I did for my South Circular Road uh, when I was doing my master's, again, this constantly came up. The number of people with Wicklow connections that came to settle in this part of Dublin is phenomenal. And I couldn't get a decent explanation from anybody as to why that might be. One theory was that there were actually market links where the two routes, the, the route through Dolphus Barn and the route through Rialto, link you to places like Blessington and County Wicklow, that part of County Wicklow, West Wicklow. And people would have come up to trade in the city and in the markets. And then links grew up with locals and they married in and they moved up. The other one might be that the Earl of Meads estate in Kilruthery encouraged people to come and live in Dublin, certainly after the war, when they no longer needed the, the use of the horseman on the estate. Everything changed in those years. I have 28 with Tipperary connections and nearly all of them are brewery. So there was some sort of employment recruitment campaign taking place down in Tipperary um, to get people to come up and work in the brewery. And by working in the brewery, you got a house in Rialto. Then we get these other counties like Kings County, Kings County being Offaly, and then there's Queens somewhere as well. Uh, there was a few of them in Queens County. And they, they are, again, uh, brewery connections. We get a considerable number from Kildare, and that might be a canal connection, because remember, the canal was a means of transport to bring you into um, counties like Kildare, certainly links with uh, Thai, and certainly other links with Offaly in Tullamore. You find them repeating uh, time and time again. But have a look at the middle uh, column there. Would you have expected people to be living in Rialto in 1901, who claimed their birth to be from Scotland, Wales, Switzerland, France, India, Canada and America. They seem to get themselves completely mixed up. Jersey and Guernsey, and then England. And when they put England on their census return, they inevitably told you what part of England. So we got them from Liverpool, from Sheffield, from Gloucester. We even had somebody from Germany. When I looked at the religions, I got a mixture. There is a majority Roman Catholic, but coming up very closely behind it, we have a Church of Ireland community and a Presbyterian community both of whom were well served by local churches. The Presbyterian community was located down near Denor. They had their church down in Denor, and some of them would have attended in Inchicore as well. And the Church of Ireland actually put a chapel of ease or a church of ease for, to support James Street Church. And they actually had their James Street uh, Church of Ease located in Rialto and that's where we get Church Avenue from. Church Avenue is named after the church that was at the very top of it, a tin church to support the Church of Ireland Church uh, in James Street because it was a little bit of a distance to get to the Church of Ireland Church in James Street and we actually had a church on site right beside Rialto buildings. Hold the Germany in your head for a moment. We'll be coming back to that. Then I looked a little bit further at occupation. And not surprisingly, the majority of people who lived in Rialto buildings of the 501 that I looked at were brewery employees of one description or another. So we got people who just said, I'm a brewery employee. We got many, many brewery laborers. We got a porter a clerk, fitter, a brewery foreman, a brewery timekeeper, 
many working in the cooperage, and a good number of Guinness pensioners, all living in Rialto buildings in 1901. We had a few with distillery connections, and again, it was easy to work them out. They gave you more detail. Bow Lane Distillery, the one located in Mount Brown, and um, that was the one that they referred to in their census returns. You'd never be stuck for a tradesman either if you were living in Rialto, because out of the returns that I looked at, I found my house painters, my own family connections, carpenters, plumbers, gas fitter, very important because of the gas light, it would have been a key job at the time. You had a plasterer, more than one. We had bricklayers. We had tailors and tailoresses, so men and women all working in fabric, weaving, that type of textile related industries. And we have a whole group that are connected with the horse, because the horse is still a key mode of transport at the time. So you get them describe themselves as a groom or a shoer or a blacksmith and the drayman. Among the women, we have housemaids, housekeepers, laundresses. Now, remember the laundries, three of them in Dolphin's Barn, big employers, waitresses. Um, I have retired army pensioners. I've retired Royal Irish Constabulary pensioners. And I even have a retired farmer living in Rialto at the time. As I said, it was easy to identify the companies. It was very easy to identify the Guinness workers, the Bowlane Distillery, a lot of people who made a connection to the railway, people who were tram workers, and those who worked in Jacobs, they would actually clearly state those things on their census returns. We also had printers, compositors. They are the people who make the, the print uh, blocks before the printer. And a musician, um, a gentleman called uh, Boardman, who stayed in the Church of Ireland Church in James Street. And we even had a butcher. Hold the butcher in your head for a moment. Before I leave the idea of a drayman, I found I was lucky enough to find this. It's a still from um, the Pathé films. And if you look at it, it's actually O'Connell Street. You can make out uh, Cleary's there uh, in the centre of the screen. And this is the Guinness floats taking place in the big, big parade through Dublin. And there's your Guinness draymen, the men who worked on the horse and carts, carrying the barrels and the various bits and pieces, all dressed up shining brasses for the big occasion. It wasn't just about being a drayman. You looked after the horse, you cared for, you took great, paid great attention to everything about the horse. And it's beautifully shown in, in this image here. Now, Remember earlier I told you to, to hold the thought about Germany and the butcher. How about this? In among the census returns that I looked at, I found that there's a resident called Charles Caesar living in Rialto buildings in 1901. He's a young man in his 20s, early 20s, living there with his wife. He's one of a group of German butchers who come to live in Ireland in the latter part of the 1800s. Others we would know of such as um, Margaret um, oh, the few of the names escape me, but some of the really well-known, but Hafners is another one. Those well-known butcher groups that we are familiar with today all arrived into Ireland in a mass um, in inward migration. Charles Caesar's living in Rialto in 1901. By 1911, he's living in Thomas Street, above his shop. This is a picture of his shop in Thomas Street. 
uh, they're so familiar, you know, that beautiful gold leaf behind glass. They were the, the typical signs of the shop at the time. The funny thing about Caesars was the notice that was in the window. Caesars pork butchers traded from here from around 1900. We know that's true. They're up in Rialto in 1901. A sign in the window said that Charles Caesar, the owner, was a humane killer. I presume they're talking about the animals. I don't think he was killing his neighbours, but you get the idea. Caesars are still trading. There's actually Caesar butchers out in um, City West, um, uh, the shops out in City West today. But it's, they also had a branch in Dolphin's Barn. So we can see their close links with the area. And this was our German living in Rialto buildings in 1901 as a very young man starting out in his career in Ireland and their legacy is still with us today. When I said Rialto buildings and the whole area was a witness to history, it really, really was. So a good example of international events that it was connected to would be World War I. Now, I carried out a little bit of analysis on some of the residents living in the entire area around that time. So I have a map here. Now, again, we're familiar now with our Rialto buildings where it's located on the map. So this is taking it, say, from Dolphins Barn towards Rialto Bridge. You see, I have a number of bubbles or, or pins on the map there, the red dots. Every one of those red dots represent a man who didn't come home from World War I. It had a, a, a really traumatic effect on this whole part of Dublin. The death rate from around the Dolphins Barn area is disproportionately high for World War I. It's certainly disproportionately high for the estate that we know of as Rialto buildings, cottages and street. There's five pins there. I think eventually I identified six. Six people who went to war and didn't come back. I go through just one particularly sad case history for you. And it's the story of the Fitzpatrick brothers, uh, the sons of John and Mary Fitzpatrick from Rialto buildings. And they died or were killed within six weeks of of each other in one particular part of Belgium. Um, I've been to both memorials and I found both their names and I've laid flowers for both. Uh, Plock Street is very, very near Menem in the Eep part of Belgium. Neither brother has a grave that you can visit. They have no known grave. They're listed among the missing and they died between March and May of 1915. And they're an example of young men from Rialto who didn't come back from the war. Imagine the effects of losing those two on a tight community like the community we had around Rialto buildings, cottages and street. There's the Menin Gate uh, where the cars are and the other one is the Plog Street Memorial. They're only about three or four miles apart, but both the Fitzpatrick brothers are listed, uh, one on each memorial in Belgium. I found evidence of a will that one of them had left. It's, it's held in the archives. Um, it's for William, but I couldn't find anything for the other brother. Uh, so it's kind of a, a poignant, sad end to, um, to a, a family, a vibrant family living in Rialto buildings. A couple of the others, uh, one thing that did happen 100 years after the death of the brothers, these are descendants of the family. And there was a ceremony held in Dolphins Barn Church to uh, mark the uh, centenary of the war. And the two brothers were commemorated and their families laid wreaths in their memory, which is some way of making up for um, losing them. And of course, the painting is held in Dolphin's Barn uh, and that painting is actually the, the final absolution of the monsters. So it's one of those things with, with Canon Gleeson. It's funny that Maria mentioned the grotto in Mead Street 
Canon Gleeson was responsible for having that grotto put there. He is the man on the horse in that picture. I also found the will of another lad from Rialto. It's, it's sort of hard to find information on them, and it's a, a piece of research that is waiting to be done. But you can see the date of it there, 22nd of July 1915. And this lad's name is Cregan. I think he's related to the Fitzpatricks. But you can see there that he leaves this very simple will. In the event of my death, I give the whole of my property to my mother. Her address is uh, Mrs. Mary Cregan, uh, 55 Rialto Buildings, Dublin, Ireland. That's his will, as simple as that. And he didn't come back either. He's one of my red dots on the map. And one other is a uh, young chap, Brown. Again, more information needed, but his will is exactly the same. The event of my death, I leave the whole of my property and effects to my mother. Uh, Mrs. Emmy Brown of 26 Rialto Street. So you can see they're all really close neighbours. Again, a lot more research needed into them, into their lives, into their families. Maybe their families are watching in tonight, but they're part of the story and they're part of Rialto Buildings witnessing international events. It also witnessed huge national events. And here's the man of the moment on the early afternoon of Easter Monday, 1916. The gentleman you're looking at in the slightly grainy picture that I have of him is Major Edward Francis Milner. He enters Rialto buildings, the block that's overlooking the old main line of the Grand Canal. He deploys 15 men of the Royal Irish Regiment into the buildings to take up position as a precursor to the first assault on the rebel-occupied South Dublin Union. Rialto Buildings was part of the whole Battle of 1916. It overlooked the South Dublin Union and it was the part that was occupied by the British as part of the Battle of the South Dublin Union in 1916. Very grateful to Paul O'Brien um, and his publication on Common Valour. It uh, has great detail in it about this event. But the story of the rising couldn't end there because not only was the buildings, that particular section that I put up there, that's the bit that was occupied by the British as part of the battle. We also have residents who are involved in the rising people who lived in the estate, who had taken active part in it. And I'm going to just bring you through a few of them, mainly women. Um, first up is Bridget Hegarty, and she's living in 94 Rialto buildings at the time of the 1901 uh, census. She's there in 1901, we find out that her father, Bartholomew, is an engine driver in the brewery. So an example of one of our brewery workers. They're living there as a family. The grandmother is living with them as well. She joins Cumminamon and she's part of the garrison from Marabon Lane. After the rising, she's brought to Richmond Barracks when the surrender takes place. She is then kept there overnight before being put in Kamenum Jail. They're released on the 8th of May. That's the same story for, this, for each of the people I'm going to talk through here. But after the rising, it didn't end there. Her involvement didn't end there. She's part of the Irish National Aid and Volunteers Dependence Funds. She actually is out there um, organising fundraising for people who were affected by the rising. She takes part in parades and funerals, in particular the Thomas Ash funeral of 1917. She's involved in that. She leaves or resigns from coming them on in March 1918. So her involvement ends before the War of Independence. And later on, goes on to have a happy married life with Joseph Harmon. They have two children and they lived in Raffo Road in Crumlin. Again, an example of people not moving too far away from their roots in Rialto. When she died in 1970, she was buried in Mount Jerome. So her world was a fairly small one, but what a life, what an involvement in a national event. Another one, I have no picture of her, but Josephine Kelly. Uh, 10 Rialto buildings 
And here, her father and mother are one of the tailors and tailoresses of Rialto buildings. Remember, we saw them in the 1901 census. These, as a couple, obviously moved around because some of their children were born in England, more of them were born in County Louth, and the three younger ones were born in Dublin. So as a family, they were moving around. By 1911, they're no longer in Rialto buildings, but they're living in Mar Lodge in Denora Avenue. In fact, she's there with her widowed mother and siblings. Um, she's a shop assistant in 1916, and she's responsible for recruiting at least six other women in the area into the Anina branch of Kumunamon. So they're actively recruiting in the area uh, people to join up. She's key because she takes first aid classes. And Eamon Kant recognises this, and it's her that he asks to purchase all the first aid supplies for the 4th Battalion in the area for 1916. After the rising again, she's held in Richmond Barracks and in Kamenham Jail, released on the 8th of May 1916. But her first aid studies don't end there. She continues, she takes exams and she rejoins the Anina branch. And in the War of Independence, their house in Denor Avenue is a safe house. It's a first aid station. It's an arms dump. Oh, they're up to their necks in it. They are still heavily involved. In fact, on Bloody Sunday, a, a, a commemoration we only had in uh, November uh, last year, she was involved in carrying weapons for the volunteers for the operation that took place in Dublin that morning. And she also arranged for volunteer Paddy Lamb to have him safely um, moved out of Ireland. When she got married, she lived up in Kimmich. And when she died in 1968, uh, she was 73. So again, not too far away, staying in the general area. Now, I had a brief look at the 1911 census and here's one that jumped off the pages at me. Look at the writing, the old Celtic script. Osgeilge, the census return was filled in in Irish. These are the O'Flaherty's or the O'Flaherty's. And this is another family from 22 Rialto Street. I think it's safe to say that when you see a census record like that from 1911, you'd have an idea they might be involved um, in 1916, and you wouldn't be wrong if you made that assumption. Uh, meet uh, Sissy O'Flaherty. Uh, she's one of eight children born to a railway worker, um, James O'Flaherty and his wife Mary. And in 1901, they're living in Bow Lane, but by 1911, there they are at 22 Rialto Street, and you saw their census return, Oskelga. In 1916, again, she's involved. She's in Cumann Amon as well, and so too are her brothers, William Martin and James. Um, again, she's in Maribelaine, part of the whole garrison there. She again is held in Richmond Barracks. She's one of the 77 women, kept then overnight there and brought to Kilmainham. And released in May 1916. She resigned uh, coming on, having rejoined it, if you know what I mean, after the rising, because she was taking care of her father, who was quite ill. But, so they had no involvement in the War of Independence. But here's one. Imagine Rialto buildings being involved in the Irish Civil War, a resident from there being involved in the Civil War. Herself and her sister were on the anti-treaty side in the Civil War. And in June 1922, an anniversary we will be commemorating next year, the Battle of the Four Courts, 103 Rialto cottages where her sister lived was the house to which Sean Lamas went to when he escaped custody from the Jemison distillery following the Battle of the Four Courts. And the reason he went there was to try and get safe passage out of Dublin. It was arranged by the O'Flaherty's and uh, it's part of our other national story, the story of the Civil War, a complete link with the Battle of the Four Courts. When Sissy O'Flaherty married, she married a man called Joe Simmons, and they lived with their family up in Crumlin and later in Terenure. And she only died as recently as 1982. 
I know you're saying Cathy's lost it. Why would she put up a picture of the Dublin Bread Company in O'Connell Street looking like a total shell? This is an example of how bad things were in O'Connell Street after the rising. This famous iconic building was never rebuilt. Um, it was quite near to the O'Connell Monument in O'Connell Street, um, about two or three buildings down from the bridge and completely bombarded, went on fire, totally destroyed during the rising. You see the crowds out looking at the rubble, the condition of O'Connell Street. You know, the rising had a massive effect on the centre of our city. Imagine if you worked there. Imagine if you worked in the Dublin Bread Company and after the rising, you realise your business, your job is gone. Imagine if you realised your personal effects were gone. Imagine if you and your sister worked there. This was the case of Delia and Ellen Morn, who lived at 5 Rialto Street. And this is a sample of the compensation claim that Delia Moran put in after the rising. And I think it's really poignant because we can see from it the job she had. She puts in a claim for a black dress, a pair of shoes, which were also black, a green silk umbrella, two linen collars, a bottle of Viral that had never been opened, that's a perfume, and a comb and a brush. They were the things she lost to the 1916 Rising when her workplace, the Dublin Bread Company, went up during the Rising. Kind of poignant. She was obviously a waitress or somebody who served behind the counter and she would change the collar on her black dress every other day. During the War of Independence, we didn't stop with our house building. And this is another remarkable thing about our history. And a little bit further up from Rialto buildings and the entire state there, this is some of the social housing that was built at the time, the housing complex at James's Walk. What's lovely about James's Walk is much of its layout mirrors that of Rialto buildings. Because when you go up the turn at Mallon Avenue, you start to see cottages in among the housing. So they tried for the mixed development there too. And this is what has made strong communities all around Dublin 8. The mixed housing that was there, the different family sizes that could be accommodated. Again, you can see the idea along the street frontage, they were the houses that got a front garden. So the introduction of gardens that we saw at South View on the South Circle Road is replicated even in the corporation houses that were built um, during the War of Independence. The other thing about these is they're built with Dolphins Farm brick. Again, another example of keeping it local and using local material. And you can see then, back to our map, but this is 1930, and you can see on the map the St. James's Church quite clearly there at the top of Church Avenue. That was the Church of Ease for the Church of Ireland in James Street. Uh, then you can see that the other side of Rialto has been developed. So you can see here, we now have New Ireland Road, Port Mahon Road, Upper Cross Road. They have all appeared on our map, where formerly the fields of uh, Port Mahon House were, are now being developed. So all through the 1930s. But Rialto, its buildings, its cottages and the street retains the shape that it had from the very beginning. In fact, the shape it still has today. And to show you what it was like to live, just up the road we had the Rialto Cinema. Uh, it opened in the 1930s, opened by uh, the Lord Mayor Alfie Byrne. But here we have the queue of children waiting to go in to see the latest film release. This is a group of children brought up by the Nicholas of Myra Centre in the Liberties. A thousand children were being sponsored to go to the cinema, the forerunner, if you like, of the summer project, going out to Rialto to see the latest releases. And they're being actually kept in line by the local Boy Scouts. They have them organised. And this is the type of thing 
crowds of children coming out to Rialto to go to the cinema in Rialto and go to the Leinster of the Dolphins Barn. Um, on one occasion, I would have been one of those children who uh, going to the cinema in the Leinster. But you can get this sense of the group of children coming out from the Liberties to go and avail of the cinemas up around Dolphins Barn and Rialto. A fantastic photograph. And again, with thanks to Paddy Lyon up in Rialto for posting this one. Look at the families living in and around Rialto Village, the children there with the push cart and the small child. A sense of community, a sense of caring, a sense of a place that you could rear your family. These are good images of the steps of the uh, Rialto buildings themselves. And of course, the, the cottages will be in and around the area too. Great photographs to kind of come across. There must be many more out there, but with the lockdown, I was limited with what I could get. Very grateful for friends for the support in, in posting things and making things available to me. And then an image of Rialto in 1952. And in this particular image in the foreground, we have the most recent development. And of course, the one here in the foreground is Fatima Mansions has now been built. So the suburb continues to develop, but you can very clearly make out Rialto buildings there in the center of the screen and the canal and the bridge are located there quite nicely too. And that would be Fatima, Reuben Street and the estate, uh, the Baby Gibson estate in and around Reuben Avenue, uh, Reuben Street, part of the lab. But you can see how de uh, developed Rialto is. And it's kind of the last suburb, the beginning of Drimna uh, off in the distance. And beyond that, in the darker area, we're heading out into Inchicore and beyond that, Ballyfermot and countryside. So Rialto was an inner city suburb from a very early stage. The mix of people that a mix of housing gives you is what created the area we have today. In fact, it grew so much as a suburb. Here's a, a nice little uh, story about it. Um, the church in Dolphins Barn had to introduce a one-way system um, as Rialto was beginning to really fill with families and with people. And it then undertook, the one-way system was you came in one door and you had to exit by the sacristy door uh, in order to avoid, avoid congestion in the church. So many people were going for mass and services up there. It also meant that the Barn Parish had to build its third Chapel of Ease. So it had already built um, Morn Road and it had built um, the house, uh, the church on Clotter Road. And then it built Our Lady of Fatima in Rialto. By 1968, Rialto becomes a parish of its own. Um, I can testify to this because it was a really vibrant parish with many community-based activities and groups all connected to the church and to the whole social circle that went with it. One thing that springs to mind is the Peace Corps, the choir, all of those things that you, you, you got involved in um, and were very, very well organised locally all to serve the growing young communities at Dolphin House in Fathom and Manchester, all around New Ireland Road and all around Rialto and Rialto Street, the cottages and the buildings themselves. Rialto Church was built on the site that was Baggett House. So we mentioned that earlier on, the home of Tasker Keys in the 1911 census. So Baggett House was the name of the building that was there before the church, a dairy farm. Up at the canal, it retained that rural look for as long as the canal was there. I love this particular picture, one of my favourites, hanging on the home on the wall at home. Um, again, you know, you're looking down along the canal. It's an image that hardly changed for very, very many years. The trees on the far side would be the grounds of the hospital, and um, the South Dublin Union, as it was before it was uh, James's Hospital. But that that whole suburban sense of looking into the semi-rural. It was there for as long as the canal itself was there. 
One little incident that I just found was uh, the day a, can a car went into the canal at James's Walk, and this young chap here, Jimmy Bradley from the Coombe, is the hero of the hour. He jumps into the canal to rescue the chap from the car. And in acknowledgement of the report that appeared in the newspaper, Jimmy Bradley gets a brand new bicycle from the Irish Rally uh, Industries down in Hanover Quay, and they make arrangements for the new bike to be given to him through the Evening Herald. So it was just a lovely little piece. He mentions in it that he was making his way from the Coombe out to the Inchicore works. So again, living locally, working locally, you know, moving around in, in your little route to find your way from A to B. And for his efforts, he's given a brand new bike. And of course, he can't not talk about Rialto and even Rialto today without talking about the Rialto's Blooming Gardens, which has won awards, the Neighbourhood Awards. I love what they did at Christmas, crocheting a coat so the little reindeer wouldn't be cold. But it's a tourist attraction. I know children love being brought down to see what's new down in Rialto Cottages. One of the key things, that sense of community, it's still there. It's still holding on and it's finding different ways of expressing itself. Their award is on the wall underneath that beautiful piece of cut brick that's set in to the gable of the houses in Rialto Street. And one important, maybe the uh, best known person to have come from Rialto Street is of course our own Gable, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel Mary Byrne, the youngest of six children and a Guinness family. And again, a Guinness family with Wicklow roots because his father actually worked in the Kilrothery estate in Bray. Originally from 17 Rialto Street, later they moved on to the South Circular Road itself. He attended the local boys' school in Rialto and then later on Sing Street. Famous for the Late Late Show, the Gay Burn Hour, the Gay Burn Show. Gaybo was from Rialto. We have our Lewis. Still going under Rialto Bridge, from which the area got its name. Where the 21st century and the 19th century meet. Thank you all very much.